Are you guys sure you've got this? Yeah. The twins are plugged in. Baby's asleep. How hard can this get? Poor men. Besides, I bumped into Chuck Norris at a Pizza Hut once. I think his powers rubbed off on me. Get out of here. Go on, enjoy your mommy getaway weekend. Oh, this weekend was a bad idea. You remember what happened last time we watched the kids? I'm not a pinata. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna need help. Warning, use of this product may alter your perception of reality. <sighs> All right, everything looks the same. This is a joke. Guys, it's like the Sahara in this cup. Can somebody hit me with some juice? <laughs> and listen, pulp, no pulp, doesn't make a difference to me. You're the ones dealing with the diaper. Mom goggles. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Okay, sweetie, I need you to sit on your bottom. Listen to daddy and sit on your bottom, okay? Daddy's gonna come get you. Don't move. Don't dance. Just sit on your bottom. Daddy's gonna come get you. Whoa, 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 whoa! Don't you try to stop me. Baby made a poopy, yes you did, dude. Where are your mom goggles? They wouldn't fit over my hazmat suit. Take this. Oh, oh. You're so cute, <laughs> And then the little boy <laughs> rocked his mommy. Oh, I love you. Forever. I like you too. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. Oh, well you take it and you fold it from corner to corner. No, I'm, I'm asking the question, how do moms do all of this? How do they handle it all? Well, maybe they have goggles we don't know about. It's as if God gave moms a special way of looking at things, you know? Okay, who taught you servanthood? Who modeled grace? Who gave you a taste of what God's love could look like? My mom, Mr. T, and my mom. Anyway, I, I just think God gave moms a special way of looking at things. Hey, honey. Hey, how's it going at home? It's all good. Guess you could say I'm starting to catch a glimpse of what your world looks like. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Mama. Hold on, your daughter wants to say something to you. I did mama. She says she misses you. And she realizes how important you are in her life. 
she doesn't know how you do it. And she knows that she can't make it without you. She said all that, huh? I don't know if she said it. But it's what I wanted to say. And I should have said it a lot sooner. I thank God for you. The twins. Um, it, it was nothing. Um, we, we have to go, okay? Um, lo love you, Mommy. Morning and welcome to DEC. We're glad that you've joined us for our streaming service this morning and I want to take just a moment and say happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. And because I get to be out front and uh, I get to be on camera, I want to take a second and wish a happy Mother's Day to my incredible mom who is watching or at least better be watching uh, at some point. Uh, to my amazing mother-in-law, happy Mother's Day and also to my uh, gorgeous wife and the mother of my four children. Happy Mother's Day. I am thankful for each of you and for the role that you played in my life. Uh, I want to take just a couple minutes here, and I want to play, uh, play a little game. I love to celebrate Mother's Day. I love to take the opportunity to celebrate our moms and to give, uh, give some things away, give some prizes away. And normally we do this live, and it's a whole lot easier. There's people sitting here in the sanctuary. They win. We take the prize right to them, and we're done. It's just that easy. Uh, doing it remotely, I'm not quite sure how it's going to work. Uh, most likely, we will uh, show up at your doorstep this week and just drop something off uh, on your porch. But I want uh, to give prizes to the moms who uh, have the winning answer for three different questions. And now, if you're watching and you're from uh, New York or you're from Ohio, you can answer, uh, but you're not going to win. I'm not driving to Ohio to drop off any prizes, all right? So this is for people that attend here at DEC. The first thing I want to know is which of our moms in this congregation gave birth to the largest baby? Uh, not the longest, the baby that weighed the most. Now, you don't get to combine the weight uh, if you had twins. Although one year in my church in New York, we had a uh, woman who had given birth to twins, and they were both over nine and a half pounds. And so we did give her the prize because actually we gave her all the prizes because we just felt like she deserved them. Uh, but we're not taking into, into account twins, but we want to hear uh, which of our moms gave birth to the heaviest baby. We also want to know, uh, and again, you can leave your answers right there in the comments if you're watching this on, on Facebook. Uh, if you want to email me, if you're watching this on our website, dan.richter at Durham E. Dot org. You can do that as well, and uh, at the end this afternoon, I'll go through all the responses, and uh, we'll find out who our winner is. Uh, the second one that we want to do here is, uh, who is the newest mom? I know we have had a ton of babies born in our congregation uh, over the last couple months, but I want to know, who is the newest first-time mommy? Who's given birth to their first child uh, most recently. And so again, in the comments, or you can send me an email, uh, let me know who's given birth to their first child most recently. And then the last thing is, I, I want to know who has the most children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, uh, the most uh, that you are responsible for. Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I don't know if we have anybody with great-great-grandchildren. Uh, but who has the most? Who is the, the mother who is responsible for uh, the most offspring? Uh, we want to have your answers again in the comments or send me an email on that. And so you can continue to comment on each of them. Uh, when we have uh, our winners, uh, again, I'll get some prizes out to you, uh, and we'll be in touch with you at some point this week. Uh, just a couple of announcements. And again, you've heard these each and every week, and Honestly, they're getting a little awkward for me to say over and over again, but we want to make sure that you hear them, or in case there's someone listening for the first time, uh, there's just two real things that we need you to be aware of. First, we have a team ready to help. Uh, we know that there's been uh, several more job losses uh, throughout this week. Uh, if you are in a place where you need help financially, if you're in a place where you need help emotionally, or you need help spiritually, uh, we have a team in place ready to help you. And you can get a hold of them, relief2020 at duramee.org. Uh, send them an email. They will respond immediately, 
And again, I know that New Englanders are stubborn. Uh, I know that New Englanders uh, are a prideful people. And uh, my fear is that uh, we'll start to get these needs almost at the point where it's a desperation situation. If you have a need, let us know. We have resources and we have people that want to help and that are ready to help and are ready to bless you. So please reach out to Relief2020 at DurhamE.org. Also, again, I, I don't even have the right words to say thank you for your faithful giving through this. Uh, I have talked to so many pastors uh, who, whose churches are really struggling financially as a result of uh, this pandemic. And at DEC, we have actually seen the generosity of our people increase. And so again, I just want to thank you for giving faithfully uh, to this ministry during the time. And you need to know, we are committed to using these funds uh, to bless our community. Not even just the people that attend here and attend this church, but as we have needs that arise uh, around the communities that surround us, we are looking to actively help in those areas as well. So thank you for your giving. You can continue to give online uh, at durhame.org slash give, uh, or you can go just on the, on the homepage at durhame.org. Up in the right-hand corner, there is a little button you can push that says give. Uh, or you can continue to mail your checks in to 114 Dover Road, Durham, New Hampshire, 03824. But again, uh, from me, thank you so much for your continued generosity. Uh, so moms, continue to put your answers. Again, you're answering three questions. Uh, who gave birth to the largest, that is the, the heaviest baby? Uh, who is responsible for the most children? Uh, and that includes children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great, as, as far as you go, that includes uh, all of them. And then who is our newest first-time mom? Uh, which of our first-time moms has given birth most recently? And again, I'll get some prizes out uh, to you later this week. I do want to take just a moment, and I want to acknowledge the fact that Mother's Day isn't a joyful holiday for everyone, and I know that. For some, and I know uh, for someone in this congregation, you've lost mothers recently. And so there's kind of a, a dull pain or sharp pain in, in some instances. Uh, and we want to acknowledge that today. We also understand that some of you grew up with, with moms that weren't, uh, weren't June Cleaver or Claire Huxtable. I uh, grew up with moms that were um, decidedly less than perfect. And so Mother's Day can be a struggle for you as well as there's a strained relationship with mom. And we also know that there are uh, many who desperately want to be a mom and for one reason or another have struggled to, uh, to have children uh, or have not been able to, uh, to become a mommy. And uh, I just want to encourage each of you during this time. For those of you that want desperately to be a mother, and again, I know this is a tough day, but I want to make sure that you know you still can have an impact on people's lives. I, I can think of at least two people in my life that uh, were not able to have children of their own, but played such a huge role in me as I was growing up and in uh, the person that I became today. Uh, I don't think you necessarily have to have your own children um, to use the gifts that, that God gives women uh, to be a mom. But don't give up. Keep praying. And our prayer for you, if uh, if that's your desire to be a mom, we're going to pray right along with you that God would bless you and that God would give you uh, the desires of your heart. But for those that are struggling today with Mother's Day, um, again, we want you to know that, um, that we're here. Uh, we may not understand because we haven't walked through those things with you, um, but we do want to take just a moment and acknowledge that this can be a tough holiday for people as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do rejoice today in the gift that you've given us in our mothers. We rejoice in that special relationship, that special bond. And Lord, my prayer today is that you would bless the moms of this congregation. Lord, that they would have a, a day of uh, peace. Uh, that they would have a day where they feel honored and they feel loved and they feel valued. Lord, thank you for our mothers. Thank you for the roles that they play. Thank you for uh, the nurturing gifts that you've given to them. Thank you for the ways that they've raised us and, and the selflessness that they've displayed on so many occasions. But Lord, true, too, we can't just acknowledge that without acknowledging the fact that Mother's Day is a tough holiday as well. And so, Lord, for those that are listening this morning, those that have lost children, those that have lost 
mothers, those that are, are unable to, uh, to give birth, that desperately want to be a mom, or for those that just have a strained or maybe even a non-existent with their mother, uh, relationship with their mother. Lord, we ask that in each of these cases that your presence would be so real in the lives of those that are struggling. Lord, I pray that you would uh, repair relationships where that's possible. Lord, I pray that you would bring comfort to those that are hurting during this time. And Lord, I do pray, as I've seen you do so many times, I, I pray that you would bless those uh, that desperately want children, that you would bless them with children. I pray that you would do this. Lord, we pray now that you would just bless the remainder of this service. Lord, as we glorify you, I pray that in everything that is said and done, I pray th that as we sing, I pray that as we open the word together, that your name would be glorified, that you would be lifted high. We love you this morning, Father. And it's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Would you worship with us? Good morning, church. We miss you so much, but... As you can see, we're one step closer to being together in person again. So happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. And let's start this morning by singing and praising our God together.
this morning, we're going to introduce a new song to you. And for those who've been watching our sermons the past few weeks, Pastor Dan has been talking a lot about sharing our testimony and how there is such great power in our stories. And so this morning, as we learn this new song together, let's remember the power that we have through our stories, through our testimony. Let's sing this together. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over. Christ the righteous 
we're going to take another step forward in our relationship this morning. I am going to give you a glimpse uh, into the deepest parts of who I am, into an event that shaped my childhood and that has a lot to do with the man that you see standing before you today. I'm going to take you back to January 17th, 1988. I was 11 years old and I was living in the city of Akron, Ohio. And I was just beginning what I, I didn't know at the time would be a, a lifetime of pain and misery as a fan of the Cleveland Browns. We were one year removed from the drive, one of the most famous games in NFL history where Pastor Terry's Broncos had driven down the field with under two minutes to go, 98 yards to score the game, tying touchdown only to beat us in overtime in uh, the AFC Championship game. And here we were just under a year later, same circumstances, the winner goes to the Super Bowl, same teams, although this time it seemed like the result was going to be different. This time we had been way down. We were down three touchdowns, and we were driving down the field and just about to go in for the game-tying score with all of the momentum on our side. And our quarterback, my childhood hero, Bernie Kozar, snaps the ball inside the 10, turns and hands it to our running back who had been absolutely unstoppable all day. And this is what happened. With the comeback almost complete, the Browns turned to the man who had gotten them this far. They're down near their own goal line. These are the toughest yards in football right here. There was never any doubt in my mind that we should give the ball to, to, to Ernest Bynum. He was the reason we were still alive at that point. And then it happened. Draw the Miner. Ernest Miner. Bumble. Bumble the ball, and Denver has recovered. Oh, my. Miner had the first and goal and lost the ball. It's still tough to watch today. In fact, I was watching a documentary on the city of Cleveland uh, just a few weeks ago, actually, at the beginning of quarantine and I was sitting there on the couch and this running back came on and he looked right at the camera and he with tears in his eyes apologized to the entire city of Cleveland and all of these emotions from when I was a kid came back up and I have tears just streaming down my cheeks and I would love to tell you that my family was kind and supportive uh, through that uh, but they were they were kind of mean uh, and made fun of me quite a bit. But it's still painful. Why, why would I want you to see that? Why would I want to show that to you? Because I think there's incredible application for the church in this. I think this is a, a great picture of the way that God created the church and, and what his vision was for how the church would function and how the church would fulfill that great commission of taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. Years after this happened, I watched a, a, another film on this specific play. And when you watch it as a, as a kid, when you're watching it live, the camera followed the ball. And so when the quarterback turned and handed the ball to the running back, the camera followed the running back. But this show had a different angle. And as it panned back, it showed a different picture. It showed a wide receiver up in the corner of the screen. And we had a wide receiver back then uh, named Webster Slaughter, uh, loved Webster Slaughter. But he wasn't happy because the play wasn't called for him. And so rather than block like he was supposed to, when the ball was snapped, he stood straight up. And whose man do you think it was that got in on the tackle? Whose man do you think it was that got an arm in there and poked the ball loose? It was that one that was supposed to be blocked. If he had even slowed him down, if he had chipped him in any way, it would have been a much different play. And probably we would have gone to the Super Bowl, and I'm sure we would have won the Super Bowl. And who knows, maybe I wouldn't be as bitter and angry a sports fan as I am today, all because of one play. The coach is called the right play. The quarterback did his job. The offensive line did their job. The running back made the right cut into the right hole. Out of 11 people, 10 did their job, one did not. And because of that, the whole team failed. A football team is a unit. Each player is a part of the whole. For there to be success, each player has to do what they're called to do. Each player has a role to play. Each player has to do their job. 
a concept that I know you Patriots fans are very familiar with. Do your job. Whether or not the play is called for them. Whether or not they have the ball or not. Whether or not they're going to be the ones that get the glory. They have a position to play. They have a role to fill in order for the church, or I'm sorry, in order for the team to be successful. And the church is no different. We're in the home stretch of this series called One. This look at the call to unity within the church body. The biblical call to unity among believers. The biblical call to see the church and to see our place in the church through God's eyes, the way that God sees it. To be willing to passionately pursue the big things. To be willing to stand strong and united on the non-negotiables. To seek God's glory above everything else as we hold loosely to our own agendas, and we hold loosely to our own preferences, and even those things that we've convinced ourselves are our rights, in order that the body may grow, and the body may be healthy, and the body may flourish, so that the world will see through us that God loves them. We're called to have one heart, a heart that loves God, and a heart that loves people. We're called to have one mission. We have one purpose, and that is to reach a lost world with the gospel of Jesus, to seek and save the lost, to be willing to to make relationships for the express purpose of having an opportunity to share our faith, to share our story, what God has done in our lives, as well as to share God's story, to take them to the pages of Scripture and show them That there's a God who died for them. That there's a God that wants a relationship with them. That there is salvation. There is a Savior. We're called to move in one direction as we've spent the last two weeks looking at. This truth that we are called to move collectively towards Jesus. Collectively towards those things that will bring about maturity in our Christian walk. To have mature relationships. To model humility gentleness and patience to have a mature understanding of what our relationships are within the church which are going to which is going to overlap into what we move on to this week and next week one heart one mission one direction and finally we are called to be one body well that's actually a little bit misleading we are one body oftentimes we fail to function as such Listen as I read uh, Paul's words in Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 3. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. We are many parts of one body. We are one body. And the work is accomplished when the body is healthy. And the body is healthy when it works together. When each part does, as Paul says here, each part does its special work. And just like a football team, if we're going to be able to run the plays that God has for us, if we're going to be able to be successful, if we're going to be able to see a victory in the spiritual realm and do kingdom-shaking work, it's going to take each of us doing what God has uniquely shaped and gifted us to do, doing what God has called us to do, caring for God's glory more than we do our own. It's going to take each of the individual parts functioning together within this single healthy body. And so in the time that we have left this morning, and then we're going to finish up next week with our look at this, but let's see how the Bible describes a healthy body. The first thing that we see is a healthy body follows the head. A healthy body follows the head. When each of my kids were little, they used to love to sit up on my shoulders. Uh, And we would walk all over the place with them up on my shoulders. And each of them figured out fairly quickly That if you change the direction that my head was going, it would change the direction that my body was going. And so often I would feel these little hands come on either side of my head. And all of a sudden my head would be jerked one direction. It wasn't the most comfortable feeling in the world. 
But they figured out that if they turned my head to the left, my body was naturally going to follow. I was going to go to the left. And if they jerked my head to the right, my body was going to follow. I was going to naturally head to the right. It was effective. My body followed my head. It's a pretty simple concept. A healthy church is one where the body is following the head. Wherever the head is going, the body follows. And scripture is very clear. Who is the head of the church? Over time, the church has tried to make it all sorts of different things, but Scripture is crystal clear. Jesus Christ is the head of His church. And we touched on this last week, but I want to make sure that we mention it again here, because this is where it starts. We are the church. We are one body, but we are nothing without the head. And as the pastor, I'm not the head. The staff is not the head. The elders are not the head. There's no denomination or ecclesiastical body that is the head. Jesus is the head of his church. And a healthy church follows the leading of Jesus. Colossians 1.18, talking about Jesus. And he is the head of the body, the church. Ephesians 1.22, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. Verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Ephesians 4.15 and 16, which we looked at last week. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Churches are too often trying to swap out other things to function as the head of the church. But it's only when Jesus is the head that every part of the body is going to fit where it needs to. It's only when Jesus is the head that each part of the body does its work and is effective in its work. And you see the kingdom grow. We can't replace Jesus with anything else. When I was a little kid, I had a friend whose sisters had Barbie dolls. And in my house, we didn't have Barbies growing up. I don't know if if my mom thought they were evil or or what it was, but we didn't have Barbies. But I remember going over to his house, and his sister had all these Barbies, and we would mess with her by popping the heads off. I don't know if they were real Barbies, fake Barbies, but we'd pop the heads off, and we'd swap heads. We'd put different heads on, on different bodies, you know, so, hey, give me that Ken head. Let's see what that looks like on here. Uh, You think that G.I. Joe head uh, will fit on here? It was a lot of fun. His sister didn't think it was a lot of fun. But I can tell you that if you put the wrong head on a Barbie, it ceases to be a Barbie. And the same is true of the church. We try to see if a lot of different things will fit. Here, try these business principles on. Here, Here, try this church growth book on. Here, try this charismatic pastor here try this denomination see if you can cram those things on there and and all of those things are beneficial all of those things can be used all of those things are tools all of those things uh, can supplement the church as it moves forward and as it as it continues to grow each has their place but none of them are the head And as a church here at DEC, if we are not functioning with Christ as the head, if we are not spirit-minded and spirit-driven and spirit-led, we may be a lot of things, but we're not the body. We're not the church. We are only the body as we're following the head. And my job as a pastor, as a part of the body, under the head, is really not to lead the church. It's to follow Jesus. It's not to dictate the direction. It's not to impose my preferences and my personality on the church. My job as a pastor is the same as your job, to know my gifting, to serve within those gifts, and to follow the head. My job is to listen and to obey as we follow Jesus Christ as his church. A healthy church follows the head, that is Jesus Christ. The second thing that we see, a healthy body has different parts. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14. The human body has many parts, 
but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit. And we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. William has really been getting into Legos recently. It's been a lot of fun to watch. And it's not the little tiny sets that he likes. It's the huge ones uh, that have 8 billion pieces and that you have to make sure that you read every single step and every part of those directions because if you miss one little step, if you've got one piece that's missing or one piece that's out of place, uh, you can't finish it. It's not going to look like the picture. It's not going to look like it was intended to. Uh, we got him a, uh, a BB-8, which is the, the little droid from the new Star Wars movies. And it has something like, I don't remember, something like a million billion pieces. And he sat down and he banged this thing out in one sitting. But he followed every single step of the directions. He took each of those unique pieces, each of those pieces that were engineered for a specific uh, part of that project, part of that whole. And he put it in exactly the right place. And the end result was he had something that looked exactly like it was supposed to. He had something that looked like the box. Can you imagine if, if we gave him that and he looks at this beautiful picture on the box and he opens up the bags inside of the Legos and he pours them out over the table and every single piece was the same? I'm sure you could build something with those Legos, but it's not going to look like it's supposed to. It's not going to look like the picture on the box. To make Legos look like they're supposed to, you need every piece in its right place. And for the church, if we're going to look like the picture of the church that emerges in the book of Acts, as you read through Acts and you see the early church begin to grow, and you see that they were devoted to each other, and they were devoted to teaching, and they were devoted to Scripture, and God was adding to their numbers daily, and this first church was exploding, and they were seeing people come to faith in Christ, and they were seeing people be baptized, and they were seeing miracles on a regular basis. If we we're going to look like that picture of the church, we cannot be a church that's full of all of the same pieces. We need each and every uniquely created, uniquely crafted piece to be serving in its place for us to be the church that God's called us to be. We need you. We need different pieces. We live in a culture that tries to celebrate being different, tells us it's okay to be different, but often we don't see a lot of practical application of that. I can remember as a youth pastor, I would have kids that would come into the youth group that were the rebellious kids. You know, these were the kids that, uh, that felt like they didn't fit in anywhere. These were, these were the unconventional ones, and they prided themselves on being different. And then you would see them in their group of friends, and there was always something that, that made me laugh when I would see that. Because these nonconformists, there was a look that they tended to conform to. They'd get in their group of friends and they all looked the same. For the most part, we don't want to be different. For the most part, we want to be like everyone else. And I think that is carried over to a degree into the church. We can tend to have a whole bunch of people that want to function in the same ways, that all want to do the exact same things, and the balance of ministry in the church can get skewed. I think there's times that we have in, in our minds what that perfect gift mix looks like, or what it is that uh, a good Christian looks like, a good churchgoer looks like, and then we try very hard to look like that. And we end up with churches that instead of being bodies are just a collection of the same body parts. You have churches that are so focused on certain aspects of ministries or, or certain gift mixes to the neglect of others. You have churches that are so caught up in, in social concerns that as you look out, you just see row after row of bleeding hearts. You have churches that, that make it all about evangelism at the expense of everything else, and you look out and you see row after row of feet. You have churches where it's all about the worship experience, and you look out and you see row after row of uplifted arms, or churches where it's all about uh, serving at the expense of everything else, and you see row after row of hands. 
or churches where it's about preaching and teaching. It's all about the person that's behind the pulpit or it's all about the person that's teaching in the classroom and you look out and you see row after row of open mouths. All of those things are good and all of those things are pieces and parts of the body and necessary pieces and parts of the body. But if all you have are the same parts, you don't have the body. The body needs the mouths and the hearts and the feet and the hands and the arms and the legs and every other piece that ties all those things together. The body needs each of those pieces serving under the direction of the head, Jesus Christ, to be effective and to do what God has called us to do. God calls us to unity within the body. It's not a cause. We looked at way back at the very beginning of the series. It's not a call to uniformity. It's not a call meaning that we all have the same role to play, the same job to do, the same gift to serve with. He works in us to create unity. To produce unity. Even as he's created us with such diversity. It's unity in the results. It's unity in the motives. It's unity in the hearts. But each part is different. And there's no one part that's more important than another. A healthy body needs each part. Different doesn't mean better or worse. Different doesn't dictate our standing before God or our standing within the church. We are equal parts of the same body who differ in what we're created and called to do. Paul continues on there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And he says this. If the foot says I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, that doesn't make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? If your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts that we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. For we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. All of us together are Christ's body. Together. And each of you is a part of it. You can read this conversation that Paul has among the different body parts. And honestly, my first reaction when I read it is always, well, that's just silly. That, that's ludicrous to think of our bodies having this conversation with each other. Uh, of course, every body part knows what it's supposed to do. Of course, every body part knows what it's created to do. It knows what its place is in the body. You'd never have this imaginary dialogue going on. And I think Paul would say exactly that's the point. This is silly. This is ludicrous. It's inconceivable that parts of the body would rebel against their role or would desire to have a different role. And what he's saying is it's just as silly for parts of the body of Christ, for members of the church to think that they're not part of the body because of the gift that they have. Or to think that they're a less important member of the body because the gift that they have in their mind doesn't seem as important as other gifts. Just like today, we're trying to find out when it comes to businesses, what's essential, what's non-essential, what should be open, what shouldn't be open, what's important, what's not important. Sometimes we try to do that within the church too. What are the essential gifts? What are the things we have to have? What are the things that we can't function without? And in our minds, we look at some of these things and then we go, okay, well, the other ones are non-essential. Those ones aren't as important. Those ones aren't as necessary. And everything that you read in the pages of Scripture screams out that that is simply not true. That in the body of Christ, there is no such thing as non-essential. 
There's no such thing as an unimportant gift or an unnecessary gift. If God gives us the gifts, it's because each and every one is necessary to be the church that he wants us to be. And so if you have that attitude where you look and you say, well, I can't preach like Pastor Terry. So my gifts must not be important. Or I can't sing like Danielle or Chris or Bree or Aaron. And so my gifts must not be as important. I can't run sound like Aaron. I can't teach children like Katie. And so I must not be that important a member of the body. I must not be a non-essential, or I must not be an essential part of the body. I want you to know today that that is a lie from Satan. Do not fall for that. God is saying that we need each and every part. Now, some may be more upfront than others. Those that lead us in worship, those that do the preaching, certainly we're more visible than other people in the church. But there are a ton of behind the scenes people serving with more behind the scenes gifting, but still being faithful to what God has created and called them to do that enable those with the more upfront gifts to do what it is that they need to do. Without every part, none of the parts can function how they're supposed to. Every part is different. Every part is necessary. Listen again to verse 18. Our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where He wants it. Our churches have many parts. And God has put each part right where he wants it. There is a reason that you are a part of this church. Or if if you're watching this morning, you attend another church. There is a reason that you are a part of that church. God has you where he has you for a specific purpose in this time. And you may think that your gift is insignificant when you compare it to other people. But God has you right where he wants you. And he's given you just what he wants you to have in order to function uniquely as a part of his body. And here at DEC, we need you. We need the gift that God has given to you. We need you serving according to that that gift. And we're going to go into a series on spiritual gifts here at some point. Uh, probably in the fall, and begin to look at what each of these different gifts are and and what they look like and how they function within the body and the truth that each and every one of us has a gift and the purpose of that gift is to serve the body. We need you here at DEC. Serve faithfully. Serve well. Be concerned with God's glory. Is God's name being lifted high? Is God being glorified through the way that you're using your gift? Be the best at whatever it is that you've been called to be and do the best at whatever it is that you've been called to do for the glory of God, for the good of the church. And what you'll find is this, I promise. The more you serve, the less concerned you're going to be with what your gifts look like compared to the gifts of others around you. Because what you're going to see is you're going to see that God begins to bless your area of ministry. God begins to bless when you serve him the way that he's created you to serve. And when you do it with a pure heart. And you're going to find fulfillment and you're going to find satisfaction in that service. That nothing else in this world can give you. The satisfaction of knowing who you are. And knowing what you've been created to do and knowing what you've been gifted to do. And then doing those things and knowing that God the Father, the one who knits this body together, the one who holds this body together, the one that has placed you perfectly where you need to be, knowing that he is pleased with your service. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the blessing of this truth. Lord, I thank you that each of us has been gifted. I thank you that you have given each of us what it is that we need to serve your body. And as I look forward to the future of this church, as I look forward to where it is that you're going to take us, Lord, I pray that you would help us to follow your lead. 
I pray that as a body, we would continually follow the head. That where you go, we would go. What you call us to, we would do. What you ask of us, we would obey. And Lord, I thank you because I know that within this church body, you have uniquely gifted each and every one of us to serve this church. To serve it in a way that no one else can. And so Lord, as we begin to look at uh, or flesh this out a little bit next week, look a little bit more about what it means to have one body, I pray that your spirit would begin to do a work in our hearts, that your spirit would begin to reveal to us where it is that we've been gifted and how it is that we can serve others with that gift. Lord, we know that the way you gift us is not for our glory. The way you gift us is not for our gain. And Lord, we ask forgiveness for those times where we seek our own glory in this gifting. Lord, I pray that we would be satisfied simply when your name is lifted up. We would be satisfied knowing that we're obedient, knowing that we're following well. Lord, I pray that as we begin to grow into our gifts, as we begin to use those gifts to serve you, we ask that your spirit would grow this place. Lord, we ask that those on the outside would see that we're not just a church that talks about who you are. We're not just a church that says we love you. We are a church that puts that into action. We are a church that shows who you are by the things that we do, by the ways that we treat each other, by the ways that we love each other, by the ways that we build each other up. And Lord, as you grow this place, as you grow this church, we continue to ask that you would give us those in this place that have not yet received you as their Savior. That you would give us those in this place that meet you for the first time. That we would see an abundant harvest And Lord, that we would be able to then walk through the discipleship process of helping new believers find out what their gifts are and discover that joy that comes from serving in the way that we've been been created to serve. We love you and we thank you for what you're going to do in this place. In Christ's name, amen.
out in all the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will say. joining us this morning. Uh, moms, enjoy the rest of your day. Dads and kids, if you're listening, uh, mom's done. She has the rest of the day off. Uh, she can put her feet up. She can go lay in the hammock. She can go read a book. Uh, kids, dads, you're responsible for lunch and dinner. Uh, you're responsible to clean up a little bit. Uh, if she wants her feet rubbed, do it. If she wants a back rub, do it. Uh, today is all about moms. Uh, and for the rest of us, I just want to remind you again, you are a part of the body here at DEC. I'm excited to see what God is going to do in this place. I'm excited for the direction uh, that Jesus Christ, the head of this body, is going to take us. And as the pastor and as the leadership here, we are committed to following him. And my challenge to you today is to spend some time uh, praying Spend some time talking to God. Figure out what your place is here. Figure out what it is that you've been created to do and where it is that God wants you to plug in. And then begin to do that. Once we begin to meet again, uh, begin to serve in that way. And just watch what can be accomplished when a body is healthy and growing together. Have a wonderful day. This is my testimony from death. Grace rewrote my 